Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. Welcome to the ABEX Technologies and ABEX Exchange Q3 2024 conference call. During today's call, I will be referencing disclosures from last week's Q3 2024 quarterly corporate update and quarterly financial statements and our regular disclosures found on CEDAR Plus and the slides we've uh, prepared for the call. By reference uh, to the press releases and disclosures, I also want to draw your attention to some of the specific cautionary statements and notices that accompany each of those releases respectively, and to start off this call by referring to our caution on forward-looking statements and the regular risk, risk disclosures of our quarterly and annual filings. Please see our disclaimer on forward-looking statements in the slide attached. In addition, given the highly regulated nature of our products and operations and the early growth stage of our ramp-up, and listing of new futures products, it's also important to reiterate the cautionary nature of our forward-looking statements with respect to products that are still subject to ongoing regulatory work and review. I'll endeavor to point out these cautions as we go, but, uh, but as of today, our regulatory status is that of a recognized market operator and exchange, uh, exchange, an approved clearinghouse in Singapore, with futures products currently trading in physical LNG and VCM carbon. Uh, and as of the, last, the end of last week, We've now submitted products for review uh, and comment in lithium carbonate and nickel sulfate. Any other potential products discussed today, including uh, new markets like gold, uh, smart commodity-based metals or weather derivatives, or even some of our innovative technology-enabled products would be subject to meeting all regulatory requirements. For those of you who uh, are new to the company on this call today, we've hosted project update uh, calls semi-regularly uh, around key project milestone period ends did not typically reference financial statements or specific financial guidance. The company is now, in of course, in a transition state, ramping up commercial operations and revenues. So we will look to transition this quarterly call to that of a typical financial KPI update in quarters of head. But, as on, uh, but on today's call, the majority of the material updates will be more of a project update and onboarding KPI of nature. So as in recent calls, uh, the call is to intended to serve as a review of uh, recent disclosures and a forum for investor q and I'm sure that the uh, Q&A portion of the call today will be heavily focused on the commercial ramp up of the ABIC exchange, but with my prepared statements, I'll also highlight some of the up exciting updates together on ID++ and the Ab ABEX technology suite. As we're excited to report that uh, uh, we are now a fully operating business in this area as well. I was actually just discussing with one of our investors just today that our Q3 update on Friday was, of course, heavily focused on the exchange onboarding and derivative product updates, but we just casually dropped the launch of three software product technology products uh, without their own standalone product releases, where each uses a proprietary combination of novel deep tech innovations not seen anywhere else in the marketplace. And in many ways, each of these software products could stand alone, stand as uh, uh, their own companies focused on just new product features and SaaS distribution of these tools. But as you know, we're building these tools first and foremost in service of the ABEX exchange, smart commodities markets, and to be able to do things in pre-trade and post-trade workflows that none of our competitors can, which would allow us to release potential new derivative contracts that nobody else can, or be able to take new market share in highly competitive markets on the back of our own clearinghouse in a major financial center. Now, if all stays on track in 2025, I suspect that we, we can really shock the global derivatives and institutional wholesale markets with no less than two software-enabled market innovations that will separate us from anyone else in the field. And given our proprietary approach to solving some of these hard engineering and compliant operating challenges, when we do launch them, it could put us, uh, I, I think, well ahead of the field in, in a multi-year development cycle, uh, again, solving these hard engineering problems. But again, sometimes it's hard to contain my excitement on, on, on how things are coming along together at the end of 2024 here, and as our team's roadmap and plan for 2025. But I do always need to caution that a lot of this forward-looking innovation will be subject to meeting regulatory requirements and to get, navigating the complex te technological adoption cycles of our institutional clearing and exchange members, which we've uh, just started to navigate with live software products. So again, having reached this operating growth stage in both parts of our full stack technology and operating business, uh, and now that ABEX is one of the handful of commodity futures businesses globally with our own independent clearinghouse and a major financial center, we should have a number of updates to share on both aspects of the business in months to come, uh, with new exchange members to onboard over the remainder of the year, 
uh, new first in physical delivery trades and battery metals futures with our lithium carbonate and nickel sulfate contracts over the next month or two, uh, which we'll talk about later in the call, uh, and new commodity industry partners still onboarding, and new milestones uh, and product releases on the software uh, technology side of our business as well. Uh, so turning to the agenda, um, joining, on, joining me on the call today, uh, as usual, um, uh, are, uh, for the Q&A uh, portion of the call, are our Chief Commercial Officer, Joe Rea, uh, Chief Strategy Officer, Dave, Ray, Dave Greeley, and CFO, Steve Frey. As in previous calls, uh, today's call will be uh, prepared in uh, three sections. Uh, I'll first lead the sections on exchange and related corporate updates. Um, and then, uh, then I'll walk through the phase two technology update, uh, uh, including some of our recent acquisition and corporate partnerships with Privacy Code and MineHub. Uh, and a bit of uh, what we have in store for 2025. Uh, and finally, we'll cover some of the corporate finance updates and, and uh, answer some investor questions in the Q&A section. For institutions and analysts who are new to ABEX on the call with us today, I would also encourage you to listen to our previous project update calls, uh, which are on the ABEX web website and ABEX YouTube channel, drawing specific reference to the previous commercial product presentations from Dave Greeley, on LNG and the voluntary carbon addressable markets, his presentation on our nickel sulfate product, the ID++ and ABEX console suite technology dem demonstration from Ian Forrester, and my discussion on our, our strategic approach to operating off of two balance sheets and two distinct complementary, complementary business units. ABEX exchange and clearing, uh, which, which, uh, which I'll also refer to as ABEX Singapore, uh, and ABEX Technologies, so that the sum of the parts uh, can realize our long-term smarter markets vision and strategy for changing the way the commodities are priced and traded to allow the invisible hand of the free market to better discover and price and distribute the positive and negative externalities of the natural resource sector. In fact, um, you, know, think, you know, talking about past presentations, um, for those of you that are starting to use large language model uh, retrieval augmented generation tools, I would highly recommend that you set up an uh, ABEX IR RAG notebook uh, of some of our previous calls and disclosures. Over the, quarter, uh, the coming quarter or two, you will see ABEX start to publish uh, some public endpoints to some of our own internal AI enhanced data and agent models uh, within the Smarter Markets Coffee House, uh, AI, AI powered agents on the X platform, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and on our public websites, EDEX and elsewhere. But for now, uh, given that we're a bit of a one-on-one, -on -one, one of one market infrastructure company as a full stack innovator in both technology and brand new global, uh, global derivative products, we have a pretty high educational threshold. And I believe that AI RAG tools can be very useful in letting investors and corporate partners use a natural language Q&A interface to parse through our disclosures and explanations of our two operating companies and the full stack innovations of ABEX. Um, for now, specifically, I would recommend Google's uh, Notebook LM product uh, with its convenient research interface and powerful token context window using uh, Google's Gemini model, uh, which seems to work quite well with ABEX investor YouTube videos, smarter markets interviews, and various PDFs such as our corporate presentations and white papers on physical commodities. Uh, for further background and pulling all of those breadcrumbs uh, and, and disclosures together, I'd recommend that investors start working with such a platform to fill in the blanks in addition to our quarterly and live Q&As. Uh, so first up, let's get into the operations. On June 28th, as you know, uh, we launched the ABEX Commodity Futures Exchange and Clearinghouse in Singapore with trading commencing in physically deliverable uh, LNG and carbon futures contracts. Five new centrally cleared physically deliverable commodity futures contracts in LNG and carbon are now available for trading a total of 98 new instruments across five futures curves. On deck for launch will be our lithium carbonate and nickel sulfate futures, which we can talk more about a little later. Our initial suite of futures contracts for LNG and carbon are open for uh, 14 trading, uh, trading 14 hours a day, Monday through Friday. Uh, but stay tuned for some innovations we're working on uh, on that front for next year. Full clearing and execution uh, are currently avail accessible through three clearing members now, uh, StoneX, KGI Securities, and ADM Investor Services, who becomes our third full clearing member at the beginning of November. Uh, we can also cover the FCM topic in more detail in Q&A, but it's important to note that the initial volume seen in the first few months uh, up, uh, up and then uh, up through our uh, Q3 
Uh, we're only coming through one or two of those clearing firms uh, who are able to trade at the open. Uh, and within these FCMs, the ABEX products were only available to a limited number of initial execution brokers and their clients and market makers, and were not available in all global regions in, uh, in some of the early sessions. However, as we recently announced, uh, we now have some of the large Swiss and global commodity merchants onboarding and connecting via bank FCMs and our clearing members, uh, which has been critical for getting the block trades uh, that have been demanded in our markets uh, up and running. As of today, we've now onboarded six merchant trading firms uh, with 16 more in progress for block trades and central limit order book trading, and nine financial trading and market making firms with 10 more in progress. And we completed the onboarding of 10 introducing brokers and five more in progress. So, we ha so we've had a very strong Q3 for uh, onboarding KPIs. And again, uh, we have one additional full clearing member application in the works. So by the end of the year, up to six total FCMs and their respective global client bases should be connected for trade across regions. Uh, and perspect uh, prospectively, at least two more banks are now in the connectivity pipeline uh, for, for next year. Um, I should also note that this profile of initial clearing, ISV, and bro uh, brokering group is very strong for this stage of a new market launch. From a peer infrastructure and connectivity pers perspective, this profile um, and, and the global merchant commodity firms um, has really leapfrogged us to arguably, you know, perhaps the second spot in Singapore, uh, Singapore's clearing ecosystem, with only the Singapore Exchange Group, uh, SGX, with a broader ecosystem as of the, uh, as of the end of the six months of onboarding. Or said another way, uh, despite the very uh, the early volumes and revenue figures uh, you're seeing in, in, um, in a new operating uh, clearinghouse and exchange platform that's still building liquidity, uh, we are already arguably the second most globally connected platform for global derivative contracts based in Singapore, which is a top financial center in the largest commodity region uh, in what I would say is uh, really a top three financial center globally. This makes our infrastructure investment quite valuable already, even before the DCF of future exchange volume revenues on our products. Uh, so borrowing and paraphrasing uh, Howard Lutnick's framing for the, the ramp up of his own FMX futures exchange, you know, a year of onboarding, uh, a year to build open interest and liquidity, and then growing and competing like hell just uh, uh, with just a few incumbent, incumbents in our market. So we're headed into 2025 and our new products and innovations in quite a strong position, uh, despite some of the launch and onboarding plans pushing out a little longer than we had uh, anticipated uh, earlier uh, and heading into this year. So at launch and through the first full operating quarter as presented in our Q3 2024 financials, we had a limited amount of connectivity and no banks or large merchant commodity firms uh, ready for block trades, uh, which only started to take shape in October and in early November with the announced block trades uh, subsequent to the uh, end of the quarter. However, uh, if you recall, we did make the call to open the market ahead of the summer holidays despite limited connect early connectivity uh, because it came apparent heading, in heading into the end of Q2 the not all of the brokers, uh, nor most of the, the traders executing from Europe or North America um, through various global uh, trading arrangements would be able to trade it open. But we realized that being the first new clearinghouse in many years uh, with new technology and new global products, it would be uh, a few quarters of, ro of a rolling start uh, trading regardless. And therefore we decided to open the market and finalize the rest of the connectivity on the other side of launch, a process which is still ongoing. And now looking to our uh, next product launches, uh, specifically lithium carbonate and nickel sulfate, we are in some ways facing a similar issue. We know that despite strong demand from the global metals community uh, who have worked with us to design the products, we will likely confront a si similar decision again in the next few weeks to launch the products, uh, even without full client connectivity, as it seems that the current state of uh, the, the institutional back office um, is, is to always kind of wait until everything is fully complete um, before you know, lifting the pencils, so to speak, uh, without uh, any real pre pre launch movements to be done in parallel. So, given that we uh, were a new exchange and clearinghouse, many of the traders wanting to use our products will push us uh, to launch, even if we if they can't trade on day one, uh, but then uh, be able to make the case internally to get moving on a product that's sitting out the mark in the market with daily settlement prices. This new operational reality makes it difficult for us to have a big launch uh, opening events, like say the initial trading of a stock IPO or something. Um, but we've always assumed that we'll be starting our markets with block trades anyway, and compete with bilateral over the counter flows as we build up a futures curve on open interest, 
with broader financial trading volumes uh, and therefore revenue to come after. Uh, despite this less than ideal product launch structure, however, um, you know, call it the negative ex externalities, uh, or, you know, a cold start market building dilemma. It's important for me to reiterate that the positive externalities of our physical delivery markets in particular, and how quickly positive network effects can take hold uh, once we do get the physical merchants connected and using our markets for bilateral block trades, which currently trade on uh, spot over the counter basis only, and where there is no centrally cleared markets for anything other than cash settled uh, PRA index products. Uh, with no futures market reflexivity and no competitive buyers and sellers of last resort. This positive externality inherent in our, in, in our physical markets uh, is what I jokingly called you know, black hole growth on X. It goes something like this. Uh, once there is volume and open interest from the marginal suppliers of our products, uh, the big merchant commodity trading firms, and there's no other market for hedging or centrally, centralized, uh, centrally standardized delivery terms, our markets at some point uh, becomes an early tipping point uh, to be a, a matter of best execution. A marginal trader can't simply ignore our prices and try to price wildly off our markets for substantially the same physical delivery terms, um, you know, further and further as we become a transparent market of best, best execution. This is not the same dynamic as a cash settled PRA index future uh, where there is no futures curve re reflexivity because a survey assessment is not a best execution deliverable price. It's a simply a post facto marker um, to really bet against future outcomes. This is why the marginal spot trade from the physical commodity merchants is so important to our markets. Uh, to, ki to kickstart that growth best execution network effect against no other, no, other, no other alternative in the markets for some of our products. And as I said before, it's exactly these firms that have helped us design our contracts, and we are just now starting to make it through the onboarding process for trading our products, as we saw with Mercury's block trade announcement the other week, as well as a large U.S.-based industrial conglomerate and trader that we uh, mentioned uh, earlier in the quarter. Uh, so again, uh, even if some of our physical delivery products launch without a lot of early daily volume, as their natural traders still can't trade them, this is not an IPO market. And we're going to continue to roll out our products so that we do have a large and connected ecosystem, so a, a, as large a connected ecosystem as possible across regions and the ability to trade every new product. This really solves two issues for us. First, it gives a better chance of trading uh, the opening launch of futures products in 2025 and beyond, as the onboarding really is a one-time thing, but also gives our infrastructure a better real option value for listing any new financial derivatives in the future, be it competitive products already in the market where we can compete on operational or technological efficiency uh, or the ability to create new products, um, you know, ones that are not yet priced into our, uh, you know, our, our discounted cash flow, in my view, um, you know, as, as we build this liquidity. And finally, uh, speaking of regions, so we also updated the market. We've begun our uh, CFTC FBOT application uh, to expand direct connectivity to additional regions. Uh, please see our latest PR um, that we put out on Friday, uh, last Friday, uh, for more details there. So beyond the exchange updates, uh, and I'm sure we'll have a, a lot more of those in the Q&A that, that we will have Joe and, and Dan join us for. Um, beyond the uh, exchange updates, I also want to spend a bit of time again on the state of our technology development and our broader Smarter Markets vision. Uh, and share with you today the first exciting software releases that took place sub subsequent to the end of Q3, which was the first time Ab ABEX released software to the general public outside of the exchange. Uh, so in this section, I'll cover a lot of the same ground from our early July call, uh, as I know is a pretty information-dense strategy, dis strategy discussion, and I'm still fielding a lot of investor questions around it. Um, and as, and we can, as we can talk about a little later, uh, as we head into the end of the year and start to plan our tech roadmap and software product uh, expansions for next year, we've also been discussing internally with management and the board if we need to pursue perhaps a restructured approach to capitalizing and funding these businesses separately. Even though we've always operated with two corporate entities, two separate managements, and two different balance sheets under the same corporate umbrella, it's been difficult to navigate our cost of capital in different businesses uh, of a multi-year capital allocation for infrastructure. As we've discussed before, the full stack startup is one of the real unicorns in software disruption and market innovation. Where everyone likes to own one in the rear view mirror of a market success in hindsight, 
But the reality is that they are almost impossible to fund without a few deeply committed shareholders over a longer duration than the typical uh, you know, fast money and, and OPM uh, managed capital cycles that we live in. You know, so to review, a, a so-called full stack startup is a new infrastructure company attempting to challenge large ol oligopolistic incumbents first, head on uh, in the old ways of business, but with perhaps a new edge, uh, but then disrupting both their own business and the whole sector through unique software innovations launched from the inside out. This is opposed to a new software business that, be, that uh, ends up being a vendor to incumbents. The challenge with these types of companies, as ABEX has painstakingly found out over the last few years, is that the traditional institutional investors don't typically understand the frontier software opportunities, uh, and the frontier software VCs uh, rarely understand the complexities and regulatory risk of a high moat traditional industry, which leads a company like ABEX to simply focus nearly all of the messaging on just the traditional market opportunity. But as we head into 2025, with the foundations built in both our clearinghouse and the ID++ software suite, we're extremely excited on how it's all coming together and what we have uh, prepared to execute on next year. Again, you know, our, our go-to-market go software investment has always been through our own clearinghouse and our own commodity products uh, opportunities first. But as new market opportunities for ID++ present themselves in the realm of AI infrastructure needs, uh, we are also looking at new paths of financing the two businesses separately. And just to go to a little deeper on why I call it the full stack startup, um, I should probably lay out uh, a little bit more specifically what the ABEX technology's full stack is. Uh, I recently published an internal memo to our team in which I explained and, and described the ABEX uh, full stack as a, as a product layer cake. First, at the foundation level of the layer cake is the open internet protocols that we're developing and will can collaborate with in various open standards bodies and open source projects. Specifically for ABEX, these protocols are in the realm of digital identity and personal data privacy. Examples of these protocols are the Decentralized Identity Foundations, uh, Decentralized Identifiers, or DIDs, and DWNs, or Decentralized Web Nodes, uh, as well as uh, WC3 verifiable credentials, um, uh, protocols for content addressable file storage, blockchains, and distributed hash tables. The next layer of ID++ is what we call the policy layer, where ABEX specifically where ABEX specific policies and implement, implementations of open protocols work into our software applications. And with ID++ in particular, there are a number of proprietary business frameworks and policies for using these decentralized and privacy focused protocols in a highly regulated business environment and technology stack, which ultimately becomes our competitive advantage in building software tooling and even moats around our business and implementation of these open protocols. That's why we're able to brand ID++ and the ABEX private network using the policies around these protocols. So that's the uh, ID++ policy layer. The next layer is the specific identity management applications, notably the ABEX Verifier and ABEX Verifier Plus uh, applications that are now live on the mobile app stores and being used right now on the ABEX block trade platform at ABEX uh, Singapore and the Smarter Markets Coffee House. The other identity management application is the ABEX credential issuer, which is used in back offices for managing membership accounts. Again, some of these pro proprietary product development uh, work and the tooling uh, just for the um, identity and access management applications could be leading software products in their own sector as standalone businesses. And we'll roll out more features, tooling, and software developer kits for pr uh, products along those lines in, in quarters to come. The next layer of the work is the workflow applications. This is Messenger, Sign, Drive, and Vault, all common tools and SaaS applications in the cloud markets, but where ABEX has the only full workflow suite built on a decentralized identity and deep data privacy stack. Messenger uh, is our first rollout underway for ABEX Exchange, and in 2025, potentially MineHub and Smarter Markets uh, coffeehouse businesses as well. The ABEX Messenger is also important as it will function as an AI prompting cockpit for the rest of our workflow and applications over time. And then the final layer, of course, is our business applications, where these tools will serve to add leverage and competitive advantage our industry, allowing us to do things other competitors couldn't do without these or similar tools. These business applications things are, are things like smart commodities derivatives with origin and metadata enhanced digital titles. 
uh, and of course, full digital title for clearing and collateral or potentially servicing, uh, or we could present, potentially service smart commodity or AI, AI enhanced features in platforms like MindHub or CopyHouse, um, where we keep uh, data private, but are able to use these uh, important cloud technologies. Uh, and then finally, see, finally uh, servicing software and data supply chain uh, with privacy code, uh, which we re recently acquired. So as I touched on in the July call, from a commercial perspective, these are three potential strate uh, strategic benefits to this full stack startup, uh, this internal disruption business model approach. First, as an indirect strategic benefit of this business unit configuration, by having our own in-house software product development team and full stack engineers working on new and innovative ways to build market infrastructure and always keeping our tech team in the so-called front office of our business, we believe that we're able to stay ahead of market innovations by not always falling back on default third-party products, consultants, and the log lead time enterprise integrator projects that underlie most of our competitors. We made the very hard decision in 2022 to change our initial exchange technology stack centered around NASDAQ systems, um, software designed to run on legacy on-prem data center configurations, and we built a more advanced cloud-based infrastructure, replacing NASDAQ with new vendors, Bay Markets, and Xberry. This decision introduced new risks and a painful delay in the short term, but we believe that the decision now sets us up much better for the long term by accelerating the second phase, or the second pillar of, the biz, uh, of our business uh, uh, using technology. And as an added benefit, we also believe that this new infrastructure and software deployed can reduce our costs significantly versus legacy infrastructure um, uh, for our exchange and clearinghouse competitors and therefore open up a direct margin expansion opportunity, and perhaps even setting us up for new business strategies that can compete on price and volume in existing derivative markets. Uh, the second strategic benefit, um, again, I, I covered a lot of these in more depth on the last call, um, but, but to highlight um, is, is potentially introducing new innovative uh, commodity products uh, that I, you know, as that I mentioned above. With our ID++ enabled software tools, our industry leading exchange software cloud infrastructure, as well as a number of new market infrastructure regulatory licenses we've been progressing from the ABEX tech side of the business, we're now finalizing our roadmaps and detailed planning for full digital title and smart commodity contracts to be revealed in 2025 and beyond. Uh, and again, I should caution, this full digital commodity collateral product is not part of our current regulatory approvals, but the advanced status of our software de uh, development and some key prior decisions to change our software stack uh, to, to embed ID++ natively in our infrastructure will enable this major uh, opportunity to be a market innovation leader when all infrastructure partners are ready. So while other financial services are certainly working on pilot stage blockchain collateral systems or the often hyped multi-trillion dollar market from tokenized real world assets, we do believe that we have a unique and differentiated approach from any other marketplace. Our proprietary approach is enabled by ID++ and our strategic uh, software innovations, the identity tech and privacy tech as the central pillars of our innovation strategy, rather than now, in my opinion, uh, the commoditized functionality of, of distri distributed ledgers and blockchains. In the July call, I talked about the identity, privacy, and distributed ledger uh, trilemma framework, uh, which I won't review in detail here. Uh, but in summary, if you look around the market today, Every blockchain-based tokenization solution ends up sacrificing or centralizing or trying to create a platform at least of at least one of these requirements of the trilemma. We're taking the approach that in order to accept a full digital title in our clearinghouse, we will require one, uh, an extremely high standard of, of certainty and finality of digital identity in the underlying title signatures, an extremely high standard, uh, second, uh, uh, an extremely high standard of centrality and finality uh, in the distributed ledger state, and three, extremely high standards of certainty when it comes to the persistence of data that is passed privately uh, between market participants. And of course, our own standards here will be very much aligned with that of our regulators' core policies and principles, another engineering and incentive problem where a lot of the DeFi projects do not meet the hard constraints of the regulated institutional markets. And so, you know, just to be clear, as I started on the last call, as we both, as as both developers of this technology and en engineers of these hard problems on one hand, and operators of the clearinghouse on the other, 
we will be the toughest client our software developers will ever see. It's worth repeating that I would never allow the current slate of Bitcoin ETFs to touch our clearinghouse as collateral, nor most of the so-called stable coins or any of the infrastructure that currently underlies them at many of the self-described quali qualified custodians in the digital asset space. They would not meet ABEX standards of digital trust that would be required for an in international commodity market, and they do not solve the trust trilemma triangle from a market infrastructure policies and protocols perspective. And finally, uh, the third strategic benefit of the software innovation strategy and the potential advantage of our corporate structure and software in the front office uh, approach to innovation is how we've configured internally to take advantage of the rapid innovation and the uh, unprecedented CapEx cycle that's taking place in the field of AI. Outside of our core commodity futures markets, or perhaps even outside of financial markets as a whole, we have been working through additional go-to-market strategies for ID++, which we believe is an, an essential new cloud trust framework for AI to unlock historical enterprise data in a private but trusted environment. I mentioned, on this, uh, I mentioned all this on the last call, but we have even more conviction around our path forward now. And with the technology roadmap as a background, um, I guess we can spend a the final few minutes before the Q&A on, on our capital planning. Um, so as mentioned, we developed the structure of Apex technology software business as a separate operating entity, yet as described above, you know, still highly complementary to our primary businesses at Apex Exchange. Going forward, depending on the capacity of our balance sheets and the corporate finance decisions we make at the parent company level, we'll continue to develop new business lines organically or via partnership or acquisition uh, on the Abex tech level balance sheet. Although perhaps uh, it hasn't worked out quite as well as we had hoped, the two balance sheet approach also was meant to help provide a cost to capital efficiency and flexibility to overcoming the funding dilemma I mentioned early, earlier about only having a few natural investors in a full stack startup. We are certainly a one of one company and opportunity in our sector in my view. Uh, which can be a good thing and a bad thing, depending on the mood of the market. On the one hand, we've achieved operating status in one of the highest margin, highest value sectors in all of finance, a commodity futures exchange and clearinghouse. But on the other, we are the only full stack startup clearinghouse uh, in traditional institutional markets outside of crypto. And in fact, uh, we may be the first one ever, uh, which also makes it hard for many check the box uh, type investors uh, to value ABEX. I also believe that we are now in a very interesting cost of capital phase transition, where we have more and more institutional investors looking at us every week as the exchange ramps up towards profitability, but we're not quite to the point where the market is affording us a forward-looking NPV cost of capital on our potential product trading cash flows. I would argue that on a sum of the parts basis, we are still being valued at a very cautiously low probability discount of ever reaching hundreds of thousands or millions of contracts per day in our markets. And of course, likely no value for us achieving our hard engineering goals of a potentially game-changing software deployment of ID++ into our markets. The second one in particular is a bit of a bit hard to swallow for me, as from an engineering and execution standpoint, in my view, it's only a function of time uh, for IDB++ to be in the market. I don't see overly complex risks beyond our control uh, to say that there is a near zero chance of us achieving this mission that founded this company. Near zero probability of ID++ success is, is where the market is currently pricing ABEX, um, you know, even as RWA tokens and all kinds of other nonsense and offshore retail markets are valued wildly, uh, even though I see little chance of them ever, uh, of the current iterations of those, uh, those tokens uh, ever touching institutional commodity markets or capital markets. Um, but I would say on the bright side, however, that despite the forward discount value issue that we've uh, been trying to unlock and overcome as the exchange ramps up uh, with more products, partners, and announcements, uh, we have, in our view, expanded our access to capital, uh, even if we're still trying to unlock a better, um, you know, better pricing of capital. Uh, there are now a number of strong uh, outbound and inbound alternatives presenting themselves as we continue to invest in growth infrastructure as evidenced by the recent small strategic financing that was uh, priced well above our closing price at the time of announcement. Uh, we'll have access to ramp up work and capital into early next year uh, after closing of, of this recent placement. And we will look to update investors on other strategic funding plans at the Singapore level or otherwise, as we work through the corporate financing paths um, uh, and choose our definitive path over the coming quarter. 
So uh, with that, uh, I would say let's uh, turn it over to the to the Q and A portion of the call, and um, and maybe uh, just to give myself a little break, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, to Dave uh, to to cover uh, uh, any updates on Smarter Markets Coffee House and the ID Plus Plus uh, uh, um, uh, Verifier Plus. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, get yourself a sip of water. Uh, <laughs> so just a very quick update while Josh catches his breath. Uh, as you know, we rolled out Coffee House, uh, the social media platform from Smarter Markets. Um, you know, really, two of the purposes for it are both to support the Commodity Futures Exchange and Clearinghouse, and also to support the tech efforts that Josh has been talking about. You know, we we started the podcast really to to shine a spotlight on the issues that we thought were important in markets and that we thought we could address through smarter markets, both with the exchange, the clearinghouse and the technology, and to see if anyone else cared. And, you know, a lot of people cared, but got a very strong following for the podcast and a very strong network of guests uh, and, and folks who've contributed to its success over the years. And so the social media platform is an evolution of that. Another place where that type of people and many of those guests can interact with each other. And that has multiple benefits uh, for ABEX as well, in that it gives us a place to keep those conversations going, to understand what are the commercial needs of the marketplace, and to understand uh, some of the problems that need to be addressed and some of the more interesting ways that we might be able to be helpful there. Um, also, with the technology, it is a way to roll out the ID++ technology <laughs> in a relatively low stakes environment, certainly lower stakes than rolling it out on a regulated futures exchange and clearinghouse. And to be able to take a lot of the industry on that tech journey that Josh has talked about, from starting with you know getting accustomed to the use of decentralized identities, to using verifiable credentials, to being able to use artificial intelligence as part of your workflow, and ultimately to full digital title. So what we plan to do in the coffee house is to begin rolling out those tools already. You know, people are using Verifier Plus as a way to gain access and to explore uh, the three levels of user access with verifiable credentials. And so, you know, that's the, the first use of getting it, those tools into people's hands. Uh, just the past, last few weeks after launch with the waitlist active, we already have 170 uh, people on the waitlist for memberships. And we've been bringing people on, contributors, getting them onboarded, letting them interact, getting conversations started. Um, and we'll continue to build that out. So very much, uh, it's very much the same cold start problem as we have with the exchange. You know, first you have to have the connectivity. That's what we're working on now. Then you build the liquidity. Then you get the conversation started. Then more people will want to join and more will want to be invited. So that's what we're working through. It's going well. And, you know, we think that will augment our efforts in the other networks we're creating. So we're creating a social network. We're creating a market network through the Exchange and Clearinghouse. And we're, you know, creating the technological networks through the ID++ technology. And so I'll keep that update uh, short and sweet and turn it back to you, Josh. Thanks, Dave, appreciate that. Um, so now I'm gonna go through some of the uh, investor questions that we've had on the call and uh, and sent in ahead of time. Um, you know, starting first with, um, you know, discuss tra uh, exchange trading revenues for uh, Q3 and Q4 to date. Um, as I understand, rebate incentives were introduced and onboarding has been productive. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, so, so first, you know, the, the, a number of the, the revenue questions, um, you know, we, we have uh, in the early, early parts of our, our trading uh, initiated a rebate uh, program. This is uh, quite typical uh, in launching new products and, and exchanges uh, where, where, you know, people are incentivized to, to make and take liquidity. Um, and uh, we are kind of ongoing discussions uh, around extending that program uh, through through Q1 currently. Um, and as far as the uh, you know trading, uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn it over to Joe uh, to kind of go through an update, and maybe I'll I'll go through a few of these other questions again, all semi related. Um, you know, how many clearing firms, trading firms, and other participants are estimated? To, uh, to achieve uh, uh, you know exchange traction and liquidity 
Um, I know, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll turn it over to Joe for those to start. Yeah, thanks, Josh. I mean, specific to um, rebate programs or incentive programs, as you mentioned, it is uh, very uh, typical and traditional and important to all of the above to uh, to utilize um, firms that want to provide liquidity in our products, which is a good thing because they've come to us and asked us to to participate in that, uh, to provide liquidity, to provide bids and offers. And so that's uh, that's something that you know uh, was done is done through to, to literally all the other exchanges that are in the marketplace, uh, particularly for commodities, but I'm sure outside of commodities. And uh, you know we 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 saw that as an important uh, point here to to get our products the you know the the pump prime so to speak with liquidity for trading. And then the result of it is that we have prices on our Gulf of Mexico futures contracts now every morning every day. Uh, which is something that uh, is attracting additional players to trade our products. We have bids and offers and liquidity on our carbon, voluntary carbon markets on both JRED and also uh, Corsia phase one contracts. And so those, again, are attracting additional uh, firms that that want to trade those products. And we expect the same will be uh, necessary for our battery metals products uh, when we when we launch them. So again, it's 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 typical. It actually has the um, the effect that we wanted to by attracting other firms, both on the trading side, brokers, and uh, on the clearing firms, actually also to uh, to participate with us. Excellent, thanks, Joe. And mm -hmm. um, again, just uh, maybe a little bit of discussion of how many firms and you know when we're getting to the critical mass of enough market connectivity. Yeah, as you mentioned, um, you know, we put out KPIs on Friday. Uh, on the clearing firms um, and clearing members, um, you know, from from a customer access perspective, it they are one and the same. We do have three full clearing members, as you mentioned, with StoneX, ADM, and uh, KGI, uh, but also two additional firms uh, in Mizuho and uh, Marex International that are connected with us. And I think the importance of that is that the customers of those firms that have a existing clearing relationships with them, meaning Mizuho, which is the, the largest firm uh, that's involved in uh, uh, finance, project financing for LNG, and I would say arguably the largest of, 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 of clearing firms that are involved in LNG markets, uh, that uh, is can, now their customers can trade our products. And the same uh, with um, uh, with Marex. Marex has a lot of firms that are involved in carbon, uh, also in battery metals. And so as we launch those products, those customers will have uh, pretty much immediate access uh, to our products. I think that, uh, as you also you mentioned, Josh, we have two more bank FCMs uh, and, uh, and three additional clearing firms that are uh, looking to onboard with us in 2025. We have one that hopefully will be on board as another direct clearing firm by the end of this year. Uh, and again, that will bring additional customers to, you know, in immediate access to trade our products. And then when you look at the, the, the trading firms, uh, we have quite a large uh, pipeline now of firms that are in progress, uh, both on the financial trading firms, but also uh, merchant firms and market making firms that uh, that are in the pipeline to um, uh, to trade directly with us and also to trade block trades. And those block trades will come through interdealer brokers. Those are the TPI caps and the BGCs of the world. And uh, we have uh, we have the, who are already onboarded with us. But we have an additional ten interdealer broker firms that. Uh, uh, that are on board with us and five more in progress. So again, those are in anticipation, the ones in progress, um, those, most of those are in anticipation of our battery metal products that will be rolled out uh, either right at the, uh, in, in the next few weeks or right in the early parts of 2025. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next the next question um, with, is with regards to market data. Uh, it was a specific question if it's gonna be available on the Bloomberg terminal. Um, I, I think it's it's best to kind of talk about a couple things with our market data strategy. Um, you know, first off, you know, we do have a, a number of partners, in, you know, in the ecosystem that that have you know made a lot of investments to be you know kind of first players in the market um, and have access to things like like market data. Um, and so, so really, that's uh, you know that's the first place is is providing you know, sort of IP whitelisting for for our partners to be able to access market data. 
Um, you know, over time, uh, there are things that we're looking at uh, in providing uh, open open data, at least in the initial time frame. Uh, you know, uh, inside uh, Smart Markets Coffee House uh, and and specific sort of uh, website access. Um, and then, of course, the third is the distributors, uh, uh, you know, such, such as the Bloomberg's and the such. So um, all of these uh, all of these pieces have been underway um, and will provide updates to the market um, in time. Um, but but for now, we're going to be focusing on uh, on creating standardized uh, uh, KPIs uh, of both onboarding uh, block trades uh, and, and these types of um, uh, metrics, uh, you know, probably for at least this this quarter and the next um there's uh you know so, some more questions about uh about lithium and, and nickel sulfate and and the timing of that um as i as i mentioned up above you know we have submitted uh you know these contracts um as as many of you are aware um you know one of our key partners in the development of the uh of the nickel product uh, was was bhp billiton um and you know the unfortunate timing around the the closing of nickel west um, kind of uh, re, you know, ha had us relook at some of the strategy of the underlying product availability. Um, you know, as we've seen in some of our our competitors' markets, you know, it's never good to to launch a product uh, with without uh, a lot of available underlying uh, supply. Um, and so, in nickel, uh, in in particular, uh, we wanted to make sure we had uh, we had the right right products in place and the right suppliers in place. Um, but that's uh, you know that's that's now been um, you know resolved and, and moving forward. Um, so we again we will be uh, in a position to to launch uh, nickel uh, you know quite soon uh, when we decide with our market partners uh, when the, when the time is is right to launch um, lithium. Uh, you know, actually, is, is a product that's that's now becoming increasingly exciting for us, um, and and a number of the you know the client participations. Um, uh, Joe, I don't know if you want to maybe get into to uh, the lithium product a little bit more, and then I can you know I can talk about the timing situation again. Yep, sure, Josh. Real quickly, uh, it's still uh, subject to regulatory approval, as you mentioned. We just submitted that those contracts to uh, to the MAS last week. Uh, we'll more than likely have three products, and uh, just in context, this will this contract, our contract on Avax, will be the first uh, non-Chinese U.S. dollar-denominated physical, physically deliverable lithium carbonate contract um, offered anywhere on any exchange. And again, we've we've uh, we haven't done this in a vacuum. We have quite a lot of uh, inbounds from it or participation and. And, uh, and and work with the industry on developing the contract and also even uh, outreach from trading firms that said they want to be involved in our trades uh, right from the beginning. So so that's ongoing. The onboarding of those firms is ongoing. As I mentioned, the brokers that are involved in it is a very heavily brokered market uh, right now. And the brokers that are involved in that market are, are onboarding with us or are already onboarded with us. And again, uh, the only uh, product that's available now is in China, mainland China, non-dollar, non-US dollar denominated, non-deliverable uh, in outside of China. And so this is quite a, a product, new product that's, that does, again, once again, demonstrate our, our, our desire to not go with the, uh, with the, you know, the status quo and, and, and develop and launch lookalike contracts that are cash settled. This physical contract will solve a lot of issues for risk management in the physical lithium markets, and particularly in North America and in Europe, where we see quite a lot of development work in um, in the production of lithium uh, as a uh, as a critical battery metals or a critical min minerals product that's uh, that's being demanded in the marketplace. So we're very excited about uh, this product. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, there's mm -hmm. also uh, some some comments and questions around uh, weather derivatives, uh, which I think we've uh, kind of revealed for the first time in our last uh, press release. Um, just as a as a broad statement, uh, I think it's important to to say that you know we're we're walking a very fine line of obviously an early an early stage company um, that you know has a lot of investor interest around you know new products, new developments, um, you know that potentially uh, becomes, uh, you know, public information, you know, one way or another through uh, through the development of products. So, 
you know, we think it's important to always, you know, dis disclose things that we're working on um, so that, that nobody has specific information that others don't. But, you know, that said, you know, when we're in the early stages of developing products, we're obviously in a very highly competitive marketplace. Um, and so we don't want to go into all of our details and strategy, you know, up until the point, uh, you know, until we're very close to the point of launch. Um, so, you know, I, I will, you know, we will take this one, but I think going forward, we need to increasingly be cautious, um, you know, just, but just making the point that we've got a very full pipeline. Again, we built this, we built this business not to launch, you know, one or two contracts, but, you know, you build a full stack clearinghouse, um, because, you know, we view that there's opportunity in commodities and energy transition in Asia, you know, the largest commodity market in the world. Um, and, uh, and, and we're going to be developing products for a long, long time. Um, but maybe with that, uh, overall disclaimer, maybe I'll turn it over to, uh, to Joe, uh, since he was involved in weather derivatives at the NYMEX. Yeah, thanks, Josh. But those are the guardrails around that. I don't think there's much more to add. Um, and again, you know, as you said, we're, we have a very full pipeline of products The the clearinghouse is really the foundation of launching those products across all different asset classes. And I think thankfully, you know, we have so much interaction with the marketplace that uh, the inbounds just keep coming uh, for new ideas and new products, especially at a very, very early stage of our development when we just launched, right? So this is, uh, you know, I look at back at all the products that we launched at the NYMEX over the years. And, uh, you know, that was with a clearinghouse that had been in uh, in existence for, for, for decades. And so this is completely different, completely new, and yet, we still have uh, have inbounds on, on new products. So I, I won't go into details on whether or anything else that we haven't developed or submitted, most importantly, to MAS, our regulator, uh, who uh, has been a fantastic regulator to work with. So um, again, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, I, I won't uh, go into any more detail on that. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, obviously some questions on gold, which we also mentioned at Update. Um, again, this is in a situation where we're still in uh, relatively early stage discussions with our uh, with our regulator, even though we're in quite you know late stage developments of the products themselves. Um, and so this is you know this the, the gold product uh, would likely be a Q1 product. Um, again, subject to all uh, regu you know meeting all regulatory uh, conditions. Um, whereas, uh, and I don't think I said it specifically, you know, we should be in a position to launch uh, lithium and and uh, nickel uh, before the end of the year. It's just the the question is uh, the optimum timing. So, you know, whether it's in early December or early January, um, you know, uh, again, subject to regulatory finalization, uh, those products will be ready to go uh, with with gold uh, in in Q1. Uh, there's a number of questions about revenue, um, and uh, again, as uh, and, and revenue forecasts. Again, we are just you know not in that not in the stage of of, of forecasting uh, any any sort of revenues. Now, of course, revenues and volumes are are closely tied in our business, um, but you know I, as I think we've said in the past, what we're really focused on is the physical use of our of our uh, of our contracts. You know, block trades from physical commodity traders out the curve. Um, that's been the primary focus. We, you know, so so one of the questions related was, you know, other than duration, um, you know, do you see any, um, you know, any hurdles or obstacles preventing the exchange from hitting break even? Um, and and you know, again, the short answer is no. We don't we don't see any issues. It's just a function of timelines, um, and of course that that becomes a, a you know a function function of capital. Um, but you know, in our in our view, the um, you know the block trades uh, you know have started. You know, as we announced in Carbon, uh, there's a number of uh, very interesting developments we're looking at for you know not just single cargos, but you know strips of cargos uh, for LNG uh, next year. Um, so that's you know a mixture of you know obviously matching buyers and sellers on terms. Um, uh, you, know, you know, the brokers uh, matching buyers and sellers on terms, having everybody and their banks or FCMs onboarded. Um, but, but again, we're working through those issues, um, and uh, and everybody's quite excited to, uh, you know, to start working some some uh, block trades and, and and not just you know not just uh, you know futures block trades, but but cargos, uh, you know, trade in our exchange exchange next year. Um, so, but, but again, you know, we, we, we do, we, we do see, um, you know, that really the path is starting with block trades, building that open interest, 
open interest then drives new volume and and that volume obviously becomes uh, uh revenue um after you know after quarter after the first quarter when we uh you know as we as we phase out uh, things like roll uh, rebate programs uh, there's some questions specifically about um, you know various banks and uh, and specific institutions. Um, so again, as 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 per the past, you know unless the institution themselves uh, are choosing to press release uh, their their involvement, you know um, as a as a market operator, we we typically uh, you know always want to preserve you know the privacy of 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 our, of our clients, um, and so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you, you know, most most of the, the the big banks, commodity traders, again, that's the, that's the phase we've been in is is being able to onboard them uh, for for block trades. Uh, are you able to expand on additional information of your lease on ID plus plus along with the path to monetization? Remember, um, so so yes, uh, we will we will definitely provide more demos, uh, particularly as we as we uh, get into some of the workflow suites next year, um, such as you know Messenger, Sign, uh, Drive. As I kind of explained in the the layer cake analogy before, you know uh, the the core of our work has really been on the protocols uh, and the issuance and verifier, the identity management applications uh, to date. Um, no, of course, we've been working across the stack because they're all interrelated. Um, but, uh, you know, but there's probably a little bit less to demonstrate in something like a protocol uh, than there is in an application. Um, so, so, yeah, we will definitely do more, more demos. Um, again, the question is the path to monetization. Um, and, and really, there's, there's, there's two things here. Uh, as I spent a lot of time in, in the you know, main comments above, uh, our focus is less on on monthly subscription type monetization, although we'll have that as well. Um, you know, the, the main focus is being able to be a, a differentiated uh, using the tools and the protocols to be able to do differentiated things that other competitors can't. That to um, us is a much more uh, valuable part of the investment uh, than the actual SaaS, uh, SaaS revenues. Um, but of course, you know, we will provide a KPI framework as well um, as those products roll out. Both from a user perspective, like things like verifiers downloaded, you know, login attempts, monthly, daily active users, that sort of thing. Um, so, so that will obviously be part of our of our presentations next year, um, as well as, of course, uh, you know, SaaS and and monthly uh, revenue type uh, type um, uh, disclosures. Yeah, a lot, a lot of other sort of strategic type questions um, uh, that I think we've we've covered a lot uh, uh, already in the in the comments. Um, and with that, I think we are coming up to the end of the hour. Let me just uh, scroll through one more time and make sure we didn't miss anything uh, that wasn't generally covered by others before. Yeah, I think um, uh, Joe or Dave, do you want any uh, final final comments or or questions? Great, seeing none. Uh, so with that, uh, I guess we've hit the top of the hour, and uh, thank you everybody for their time. Uh, please, obviously, uh, follow up on uh, uh, in in the investor email. Um, I'm always uh, pretty available, as you know. Uh, and, you know, like I said, we're be looking to roll out some some AI uh, related tools uh, for investor education and questions as we go as well. Thanks, everybody.